Hi, my name is Dr. Lauren Brown. I'm the Clinical Director of AccuBalance Wellness Center, located in British Columbia, Canada, where I practice uh, Chinese medicine, naturopathy, and functional medicine. And what I'm going to share with you today is a lecture, it's about an hour long, by Dr. Dan Kalish. And he's going to talk about fighting adrenal fatigue with functional medicine. And what this means is he's going to talk about how he uses the Kalish approach to address um, what we call these top five symptoms or problems, which are all connected to this adrenal dysfunction. So let me know if you have or think about whether you have any of these signs or symptoms. Fatigue, um, gut health, digestive issues basically, um, depression and or anxiety, pain, and um, female hormone imbalances, um, PMS, regular cycles, menopausal symptoms, and what we see a lot at AccuBalance is infertility and miscarriages. So if you're experiencing those symptoms, um, I'll throw another one in there, weight gain, um, even though you eat well and exercise, this could actually all be connected to an adrenal dysfunction. Um, and the Kalish method is about using um, an approach based on lab tests to um, repair the adrenals and basically reset or regulate this brain adrenal connection to bring your body and mind back into balance and with that you should see increased energy, your mood should improve, pain should dissipate, your gut health can improve and your hormones can come in balance and in this case optimize your fertility if you're trying to conceive. Um, you're going to hear and see me um, in this video to come um, talking about Medigogy.com and ProD seminars. Many of you only know me from AccuBalance. Uh, I want to share with you that I also run a platform that is for educating my profession, my colleagues, um, and also a platform that's just general educating health professionals and the public. And the talk here by Dr. Dan Kalish is on Medigogy.com, which is the platform that is free and it's to educate um, the public and other healthcare providers. And I just thought this talk was so important, I wanted to make sure my AccuBalance family had easy access to it, so I put it here on our website. Because, because in our practice we see so many couples, and particularly women, that come in with the fatigue, weight gain, um, depression or anxiety, and obviously the infertility and other hormonal imbalances, and weight gain um, sometimes is a complaint. And we have found that this has this common underlying imbalance. And at AccuBalance, we use the Kalish method. And so having trained with Dr. Dan Kalish, um, we offer the test that you're about to hear about. And we also use this method, um, as well as the other things we do here at AccuBalance, this integrative approach to help bring balance back and to help you regain um, health and vitality. So I hope you enjoy this lecture, and um, we hope to offer many more to come. And obviously, if you're patients at AccuBalance or you have questions, feel free to uh, send us an email or a call at AccuBalance if you're in the Vancouver area. We'd be happy to uh, talk more about how we use the testing and the Kalish method to uh, address the issues that Dr. Dan Kalish is going to talk about relating to the adrenals. Enjoy. I want to welcome everybody to Medigogy.com. I'm your host, your moderator, Dr. Lauren Brown. I'm a practitioner of Chinese medicine in Vancouver, BC, Canada. My clinic is called AccuBalance. And today our topic is um, adrenal fatigue, um, restoring the healthy adrenal function. Our presenter is Dr. Daniel Kalish. And I'm um, really excited about this. i got to give you a little bit of history behind, um, behind Dan. Many years ago, and I don't even know if he knows this story, but many years ago I was walking in California and I came across a, a shop that I really liked. It had um, dresses in it and the back had all these great uh, books. And one of the books was this book, Your Guide to Healthy Hormones. Um, I read the book. I really enjoyed it. The author's name doesn't stick to my head. Just a hint, it's Dr. Dan Kalish, though. <laughs> and uh, months go by, years go by, and then um, I see on Dr. Mercola's website a great interview by this Dr. Dan Kalish talking about the Kalish method. So then I go to his website, and I love his program that he has, and I think, wow, i got to have this guy on Metagogy and Pro-D. So I invite Dan to speak, which you can see he's doing. And I was talking about this book, and then I, as a fool, I realized it's his book. <laughs> and, um, and then I later got the second book. So 
Dan is here on Metagogy, and it just shows you how important it is to share your thoughts and write books, because, I mean, this is the book that many years ago got me started on this functional medicine journey, and got me interested in having Dan Kalish come and speak to us today. If you want his official bio, please do go look at the Metagogy page or ProD page. You can see his official bio and all his credentials. I will let you know that you're about to hear a great lecture on functional medicine. If you haven't downloaded the handouts already, please go to the Metagogy page that this is that you launched this uh, webinar from, and you can see the handouts there. Um, Dan has put together an incredible program. He calls it the Kalish Method, and he has a program where um, he can train you online to really work with a functional medicine approach. We have a few courses on Metagogy for free that you can watch. We have one called um, How to Diagnose and Resolve Heartburn, Reflux, and Stomach Pain and Nausea. And there's another one on how to, solve how to resolve or solve allergies with functional medicine. Plus, he has a 12-hour CEU-approved course on Pro-D seminars called Introducing Functional Medicine into Your Acupuncture Practice. So he's created a functional medicine program for acupuncturists. And if you like all that, then hopefully you'll check out his website because he has a very comprehensive, this is, we're just showing you 12 hours. He's, he has many hours um, of interaction online where if you really want to learn how to use this functional medicine approach in your clinic, then he can help train you. So we're hoping you're going to get some really good clinical pearls for your practice and for the public that's, that's watching this. You're going to get some ideas and maybe some of your signs and symptoms. You'll see how they're related, for example, here to your adrenal. And you'll find out that there are practitioners that do this functional medicine approach or integrative approach, so functional medicine with acupuncture, that can help you relieve a lot of these symptoms. Having said that, I do need to remind you of the disclaimer here that the course here that you're about to listen to this lecture and the handouts contain general information about medical conditions and treatment. This information is not advice. It's not meant to be uh, used as treatment. Um, so please do seek out a healthcare provider um, for your health, health conditions. Throughout the webinar, if you're watching this at the live webinar, please post your questions. I'll moderate those and present those to Dan. If you're watching this as a recording and you have more questions for Dan, then again, send them through Metagogy or go directly to Dan Kalish's website, which we'll put up um, as well. So without any further ado, I give you Dr. Dan Kalish. Thank you very much, Lauren. And that's a funny story about the book. I didn't know that. That cracks me up. So anyways, um, Dr. Dan Kalish here. I'm super happy to be talking to you all about uh, testing the adrenal glands. And, you know, just a reminder, too, that none of this stuff is new. You know, I think uh, if you are a practitioner of Chinese medicine, acupuncture, uh, herbs, and whatever you may do, this information has been around for generations, thousands of years. You know, all we're doing is taking something and putting it into a slightly more modern context um, in terms of lab testing. But I know you all have you know, stress is a major component in, in all the practices that you work with. And I find that uh, the particular way that I approach functional medicine works really, really well with acupuncture practices. Um, I've been working with a lot of different clinics over the years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, what the adrenal glands are, how they get stressed, how we look at stress, you know, again, in this Western model, and the relationship, and this is an interesting one, you know, to GI health, which is really, really critical. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you can start to fix these problems, too, which is the important part. So I went to school, you know, I ended up with a bachelor's degree in physiological psychology and philosophy from Antioch College. Um, when I was doing that, I studied at Cambridge University. I was very ambitious as a younger person. I ended up going to chiropractic college. I've been in practice forever. You know, I'm at that stage of my career where I try to make it seem like I've been practiced less time than more time, but over 20 years, lots and lots of patients. And then I've got this, like, strange resume of things that happen to me all the time, Patrick Kennedy picked up the phone and called me a couple years ago. He invited me to this One Mind for Research program in integrative neurology. Go figure. I was trapped in a suite of rooms at a fancy hotel in Boston for three or four days with the 200 top neuroscientists in the world. I work with the Mayo Clinic, really interested in the Mayo Clinic practitioners. They've, a bunch of them taken my class. I work with them on a regular basis still. And even um, you know, with this wide range of people that are interested in this stuff, from Mayo Clinic to Mercola, trained Mercola's host, whole staff, We've got about 700 people that have gone through my training program now, you know, keeping ourselves busy. But when we go back in time, you know, this is me when I had a lot of hair, um, to my earlier clinic days, um, you know, I was not doing so well health-wise. And I had, you know, to go through a personal journey to fix my adrenal glands and my digestive problems and whatnot, that I really kind of launched my career in a sense and created a, a lot of the work that I teach now. So a lot of this is from personal experience and then from some really excellent training 
from a whole variety of functional medicine experts that really sort of took me under their wing and spent a lot of years working with me. So, you know, in terms of how we think about functional medicine itself, and there's a lot of different models for functional medicine, and what I try to do is just keep it as simple as humanly possible, because life, as you all know, is complicated enough as it is, right? So the, the idea here is that we have these different levels, and we have patients that are coming in under the symptomatic umbrella, where they're having symptoms and problems, and we have to, you know, you know, address that in some way, indirectly, hopefully. We have body systems that we're going to talk about, hormones, gut, detox, different systems, right? And then we have the underlying root causes, which is what we're trying to determine based on the labs. So the, the, I see the, the sort of uh, work that we have as practitioners is to translate for our patients who are suffering from symptoms this language of functional medicine, which is based on body systems and based on root causes. And, you know, people don't come in thinking that they have a root cause of a certain problem. They're coming in tired or depressed or fat, and we have to then, you know, try to solve that. And so years ago, I had an inspiration, which I get sporadically, and I thought, hey, office manager, why don't you please go out and get a whole year of every new patient chart, you know, pull the charts. This is back when we used paper, actually, and pull every new patient chart for the last year, and I want you to write down the top three complaints of every one of my new patients in the last year. And she was gracious enough to do this, and when the information came back on my desk, I realized that the vast majority, probably 90-plus percent of the patients that I was seeing suffered from one of these five problems that's up on the board right now. And so this was a, sort of a breakthrough for me, just thinking-wise, that I could categorize people in a way that most people that I was working with were either overweight, fatigued, depressed, had digestive problems, or female hormone problems. And so... Once I realized that was a big component of my practice, I started to think about it, and you look around, and these are really, these, it wasn't a mistake that this happened. These five complaints lend themselves well to functional medicine protocols. They're very consistently, effectively addressed with functional medicine. You know, you're going to pretty much get all the people with these five problems improve, maybe not 100%, but significantly, you know, and... You know, it's going to make uh, your life easier to kind of have a niche where you can focus on things and not try to address everything under the sun with functional medicine, at least in the beginning when you're first getting started. And then the other beautiful thing about these big five um, symptoms is that they're not very well treated and oftentimes mistreated and made worse by conventional medicine. So what a really great niche for us, something that the competition, the conventional doctors don't do well on. In fact, they may make people worse usually for the treatments that they offer and something that we can do a great job on with functional medicine. And so again, it can be a very complex subject area, but if you break it down to these five chief complaints, it makes it so simple, and then you can move on to the more complicated cases, you know, once you get more advanced in this work. So again, simplicity, we're looking at three body systems, the hormonal, digestive, and detox systems. Lab tests for each symptom, each system, right? Gut testing, Detox testing, hormone testing, boom, 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 right? It's very simple. There are a million gazillion different functional medicine tests you can do, but my mission really at this point and the way that my career has taken me is to stay with the really basic stuff and do the basic part of functional medicine really well. And if things get more complicated, then you can escalate. But we find, you know, now having trained so many hundreds of doctors that this model works really well for people who want to have a, you know, a, um, a low-tech, easy to run, financially successful, not emotionally draining practice, you know, to keep things simple here. So we're thinking about why all this works or how come this works? Why is this model, what makes this model sort of valid? We go back to a patient I talk about oh, almost every time I give a talk, this woman's name is Barbara, and um, Barbara came in and she had just, back in these days, I was living down in San Diego and I had a practice down in San Diego. Barbara had just moved from Texas, um, rather imposing woman, came in the office, sat down, and looked at me and said, I am fat, I am tired, I'm depressed, what are you going to do about it? And, you know, you know, you have these moments, these sort of epiphanies in practice where, uh, in this case, you're sort of scared into coming up with some kind of a response to what a patient is sort of demanding of you. And rather than being polite and really uh, deferential, as many patients are, she was maybe like more confrontational, like, yeah, 
you fixed all my girlfriends, but what are you going to do for me, and why am I going to lay down all this money for cheat you? And when Barbara sort of pushed me to that level, I, I realized I had to come up with a pretty good comeback. And during that, like, two or five or ten second interval between her comment and my comeback, this whole clinical model just gelled in my head, just boom, just happened. Sort of, I don't know, it wasn't really a vision, but it just kind of came to me. And this is what I teach now. It's a really great model. It works well. And it's totally predicated on everything that I had already learned. I actually didn't make any of this up. I just sort of synthesized it and created some really kind of colorful looking PowerPoints. But this is, to me, the heart and soul of functional medicine as I was taught functional medicine now uh, in a format that's easier to understand. Okay? So none of this is original. This is just my framing of it. Let's put it that way. How your body falls apart. We're under stress. What kind of stress? Emotional stress is leading stress. Someone dies, there's a divorce, you have a baby, you have your third baby, right? you're working too hard. That stress pushes that first body system, the adrenals, to the max. Eventually, if the stress goes on for long enough, then the GI system starts to fall apart. Okay? And there's complicated reasons for that. We can talk about secretory IgA levels are lowered or upraised. You know, the gut basically wears out as we're under a lot of continued stress. Then all of a sudden, you have what we call leaky gut. You start to pick up pathogens, you're reacting to foods, all these different GI problems start to develop once you're in the stress pattern for long enough. And then eventually, if the gut is generating enough badness in the world, it's going to dump a whole boatload of toxins onto the liver, the detox systems of the body start to crash. So this is a pretty consistent pattern. People are under a lot of stress, their GI falls apart, they get toxic. And what we're looking for with the labs is where in this process you're going to intervene, how bad is it? And what are we going to do about it, all right? So this is not true 100% of the time. Nothing is true 100% of the time. But this is a good enough model for us to base, you know, whole practices on. So then the epiphany part of this, because you can see that the model is pretty straightforward, right? The epiphany part for me, though, was that the model dictates the correction, right? So we're going to correct the body system in the order in which the problems occurred, which is a very, very ancient idea in all kinds of other med, you know, systems of medicine, right? This is not new. It's just sort of a framing of it in functional medicine. We're going to test and correct the hormones and the GI tract and the detox systems in that order. You can do all the labs right away if you want, but when we do treatment protocols, we're very specific about starting with addressing the stress response, then fixing GI, and then detoxing the person at the end, which runs counter to a lot of ways that uh, programs are done, but you know, can get into detail later if you have specific questions about why that sequence is so important. But it turns out that I, I think the hallmarks of what I do that make it special in terms of functional medicine are that it's lab-based and that we have a really clear model that's sequenced out. So we're not trying to change it for every patient. So the heart and soul of this all starts with the adrenal hormones and how we respond to stress. So when we're under stress, we have the adrenal glands producing hormones like DHEA and cortisol, trying to regulate the stress response. Right? And to the extent that you have uh, a balance between these two hormones, you're going to be healthy and fit and relaxed and sleep well and have a great sex drive and all that. But if you're under a lot of stress, the hormone levels first shoot up. If that stress goes on for a long period of time, then the hormone levels drop lower and lower and lower and lower. So the initial stage of adrenal stress is high cortisol. Eventually, the levels drop more and more and more, and we get into these more advanced stages of adrenal fatigue. Okay, and then why is that important? Why does it really matter? Well. It turns out that the adrenal glands, or you could also say this as our hormonal system, our stress response, is a centerpiece in all these different body activities. So if you look at it, the upper right-hand corner, cortisol plays a huge role in the brain, neural tissue health, right? You know that if you um, sort of uh, flood uh, the hippocampus part of the brain with high levels of cortisol, it literally kills and destroys brain cells, chews them up. Go to the lower right-hand corner. Cortisol is playing this dance with insulin. It's a glucocorticosteroid, right? It's controlling blood sugar along with insulin. When cortisol levels shoot up, thyroid hormone levels are immediately downregulated. You've got cortisol um, levels going up. You're going to have a depletion of progesterone. So you get sex hormones and thyroid and blood sugar problems all kind of tied into this. When you go to the middle bottom of the diagram, you'll see, and this is, you know, late night TV. You, you see these shows, right, like Cortate Cort Cort or Cortislam or, you know, different, like, cortisol-lowering products to help you lose body fat because when cortisol gets messed up, we store body fat in and around the abdominal organs to protect ourselves, which is highly functional and a great survival mechanism, but, you know, unsightly, I guess, especially if you live in California, you want to wear a bathing suit, you want a whole bunch of abdominal belly fat. 
Um, cortisol, lower left-hand corner, has a role in detox capacity. You go up a notch there, you can see cortisol also plays a role in eicosanoid mo modulation, you know, has this cortisol, cortisone, very strong anti-inflammatory role, right? Upper left-hand corner, again, cortisol is a glucocorticosteroid, helps stabilize blood sugar, playing with insulin back and forth. And then in the middle of the upper part of the diagram, you think of cortisol, um, like with all the itises, right? The bursitises, tendonitis, myofasciitis, because it's anti-inflammatory. So it has a really strong role in connective tissue. You know, if you're working with athletes in terms of how they recover, people who are prone to injury, people who are in a lot of pain that's related to, you know, musculoskeletal type syndromes, and um, also plays a role in bone, bone turnover. I mean, it kind of does a little bit of everything. And when the cortisol to DHEA ratio is out of balance, the only question becomes is which one of these little bubbles is going to take the hit? Is your thyroid or your sex hormone levels going to drop? Are you going to have the bursitis, tendinitis, myofasciitis? You know, are you going to have a brain problem, which would be sleep or memory or depression? You know, where is it going to go and what's going to happen? Um, I'm very fascinated by the connection between stress and depression as well. Um, there's a researcher here near me in, at Stanford University, Robert Sapolsky, who's devoted his whole career towards that, one of the great neuroscientists of his generation. Um, stress and depression is a huge, huge connection. Yep. And if you guys are interested in Sapolsky's work, I can get connected with him, uh, some of his videos and whatnot, and his books. So um, the causes of adrenal fatigue, right? And again, it, it's simple because we're really, I always try to teach classes and practitioners with the exact same language that you all would want to use when you're working with your patients. So rather than like talking about cytochrome P450 pathways, we talk about you know, a toxic liver, rather than talking about glucocorticosteroid inhibition of conversion of active T3 to inactive T blah, 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 we talk about weight gain, you know, so we try to keep it really simple. And so when you're looking at the causes of adrenal fatigue, it took me about 12 years to come up with this. And I know it looks easy, but it took a long time. There's three causes of adrenal fatigue that are primary, emotional, dietary, and inflammatory. Boom, boom, boom. Most people, when you start to talk to them for a while, have all three. And so if you can reduce something so complex down to something simple, then patients can get enrolled and understand what you're talking about. And that gets them excited and that makes them want to do the lab testing. When in my earlier years, my first years of practice, I talked about cytochrome P450 pathways and I talked about inhibition of active and inactive thyroid hormones, you know, people just glazed over and didn't understand what I was saying and didn't understand how it related to them. So I, I really want to always have us explain functional medicine and talk to, about functional medicine to each other and to our patients in a language that's easy to understand and applicable so that people want to do the testing. Okay, so emotional, dietary, and inflammatory stress. Those are the three major reasons why you'd have a problem with your adrenal glands. And most people have all three. And it's in that order, okay? So in a perfect world, and I guess a perfect world does exist, we see normal people with the adrenals once in a while. And you would wake up in the morning and your cortisol would be at its peak, around 20 units with the labs that we measure. The lab, and then at night, right before you go to bed, it would be down around a two. And so nature has designed what is really, the more you study it, the more amazing it becomes. Just the absolute most beautiful, perfect rhythm you could imagine linked into our exposure to light and dark. It's functional. It allows us to get to the ecstasy that you would achieve in meditation. It allows us to build bridges and dams and roads and sports cars. It allows us to take care of children. I mean, this rhythm is like the heart of human civilization. We wake up when the sun comes up. We're busy during the day. Our cortisol levels are peaking. You can see how high they are in the early morning hours. And then by nighttime, they're down. And we're turning off our email. We're getting away from our cell phones. You know, we're going back into rest and recovery. So it is a beautiful rhythm. The more tied into this exact rhythm you are, the healthier you're going to be. And what we're doing with the labs is measuring where people stand in relation to this rhythm and then resetting them back to this natural rhythm. That is the goal, resetting them back to this natural rhythm. And it's a, it's a fun and interesting project. So think about the adrenals when they're healthy. You get lean people. They're burning their body fat appropriately. They're not storing it. You've got great energy levels. You wake up in the morning. You want to get a lot of things done. You've got a great mood. 
you know, I mean, unless something bad happens, I mean, if something bad happens, you shouldn't be happy. But, you know, the default setting has a great mood. You have a wonderful immune response in your whole body as well as your GI tract. For women and for men both, you know, sex hormone levels are good. Sex drive is good. And then what we see with the bulk of our clients, right, is this scenario, which is that um, we've got fatigue, we've got depression, weight gain, female hormone issues, digestive problems, allergies, cravings, pain, not great immune responses, people that don't sleep well, they're irritable, anxious, they can't concentrate, their memories aren't that great, right? And this is, you know, kind of modern life wearing us down, pulling the adrenals down. And these are the kinds of issues that we can correct with a simple adrenal test. So it's a very, very widespread application to any of those conditions. So in a normal world, you would be in a normal box, all right? And in the normal world, your cortisol levels would go up on a rough day, they come back down on a day off. On a day where you're just lying around, you're not doing anything, your cortisol might dip a little lower. On a day where you have to give a presentation to 10,000 people, your cortisol might be extremely high. But the key is that you're bouncing up and down in the normal box there. Now, over time, what happens is that you can enter into what we call stage one. Stage one means the cortisol levels have gone up and they've stayed up for so long and you've been stressed so consistently for so long that that shutoff mechanism is no longer working. So now your cortisol levels are high every day, even on a rest day. And then eventually that stage one progresses to a stage two and a stage three where the adrenal glands start to burn out and cortisol levels drop lower and lower. Symptoms get more and more severe as cortisol levels drop out. And the lab testing shows us exactly where in the scale the person is. Okay, now this is my favorite diagram of all time. I know it's a little confusing, um, uh, but it really just shows, it answers so many questions all at the same time. Okay, so we've got the HPA axis, and you can see there hypothalamus pituitary, pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis. That's basically saying the brain communicating with the adrenal glands. Right-hand side, you've got the brain communicating with the thyroid. So notice that this is all about the brain. So we call it adrenal fatigue or adrenal burnout. A more accurate way of saying that would be to say HPA axis dysregulation or HPA axis dysfunction. Or if you want to speak in English, you would say, hey, your brain isn't controlling your hormones properly anymore. Your brain has seen too much. Your brain has been under stress for long enough. It doesn't know how to reset and bring things back down to where they should be. So at some deeper level, if you want to get a little metaphysical with all this stuff, or, or if you really want to delve into the biochemistry, it's really a brain-related problem. And that's why Patrick Kennedy picked up the phone and called me and invited me to this neuroscience conference because he understood um, at a deep level that, you know, there's something going on here that's more, there's more to all this than just giving people antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs and trying to treat people for all these various neurological brain-related problems, that stress is a big component in, in these different uh, issues that are really, really common with people that we're working with. Okay, so think about it this way. When the brain is under stress, it tells the adrenal glands to make more cortisol. There's normally a feedback loop that now the stress is over, and the brain then tells the adrenal glands, okay, Chill out. It's over. The tiger is gone. You don't have to run anymore. The war is over. You don't have to fight anymore, and you can reset. But when you're under stress continually, that normal shutoff mechanism, that normal sort of preventive relief valve that resets breaks, and then you have HPA axis dysfunction. Okay. So it's, now, if you look at this, the lower middle um, of the slide, you'll see there's this little inhibition loop. So as soon as your cortisol gets messed up, you see how there's an inhibition of conversion of thyroid hormones. And there's another inhibitory loop that goes over the TSH. It's a little higher up there. So again, as soon as cortisol is involved, thyroid gets involved. And you, as a rule, are going to have some level of thyroid issue with all your adrenal patients as well. Okay? So when we're looking about, uh, thinking about thyroid, we want to determine, is it, prior, is it a primary thyroid problem or secondary? So the way that Dr. Timmons used to define that, this is the way I was taught, um, was a secondary thyroid problem means that the thyroid is out of balance strictly because cortisol is out of balance. When we correct cortisol, the thyroid bounces back, the thyroid problem is done. A primary thyroid problem means that outside of any issues with cortisol, the thyroid has a primary issue all in and of itself, which needs to be treated separately. So one of the things we try to determine, and this is complex, is, is the thyroid problem 
primary and need to be addressed, or is it an adrenal-related problem, and we could fix it from the adrenal side. All right, so here's my second favorite diagram. So we thought about how the brain regulates stress hormones and how it's really a brain problem. Now, if we want to get down to the level of the hormones, here's what's happening on a biochemical level. When we're under stress, you can see pregnenolone, and the little red arrows, converts over to cortisol, all right? And pregnenolone going over to cortisol in a continual, continual day in and day out way will deplete the ability of the body to have pregnenolone go down towards DHEA, estrogen, and testosterone. So you see that big circle with the X, yeah? So when we're under stress, we make a lot of cortisol, progesterone, DHEA, estrogen, and testosterone levels all then drop. So when you see patients that have progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, or even DHEA level problems, any of the sex hormone problems, you're going to, you know, most of the time have someone who has an adrenal issue that's underlying all that, right? And that's super, super important because if we can fix cortisol and DHEA, stop this pregnenolone steal, they call it, this diversion of pregnenolone, then it's going to make a huge, huge difference in terms of how people respond. And where I'm not against, I have no problems with people using progesterone, estrogen, even testosterone if they need it, but you always want to address the underlying mechanisms that are triggering these problems as well as treat the actual sex hormones themselves. Another diagram, kind of the same thing, but looked at it in a different way. Again, you can see how when we're under stress, cortisol levels go up, pregnenolone then does not convert into DHEA, estrogen, and testosterone. So we never want to do sex hormone treatments by themselves. We always want to combine it with an adrenal protocol. All right, so we're back to Barbara. I told you to talk about Barbara all the time. 52 years old, right, walks in. What are you going to do about it, Kalish? Night sweats, hot flashes, psychotherapist, brilliant, brilliant woman. Um, and had a lot of GI stuff going on too, food allergies and anxiety. So here's a typical adrenal lab. And this is Barbara's first test. Remember, when you're first under stress, cortisol levels shoot up, and then over time they drop, 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 drop. So what you see here with her total cortisol, you look at cortisol sum, is a 12. Should be ideally around a 35 or 40. So she's in that stage three where her cortisol levels have bottomed out. DHEA is low, it's down at a two. So this is a stage three, as remember now, okay? And one of the things about the labs is that they're getting really popular now. When I started doing this 20 plus years ago, no one was really testing adrenal guns. It was kind of a weird little subspecialty that I got into. But there's a lot of people testing now and a lot of people running these labs. But the original history behind all this has been lost. And so I'm here, I mean, I guess my mission, if you want to call it that, that I have decided to accept is to um, communicate the stuff that I was taught by the original doctors that first started doing these tests. And all the things that they learned, it would just be a horrible shame if they weren't, you know, passed on to the next generation. And so as popular as these labs are, you see a lot of people that, you know, weren't trained properly uh, just because they weren't exposed as I was to these originators of the lab. So um, Dr. Timmon and uh, Timmons and Ilias, in the, gosh, it was like a early 80s maybe, went to Europe, saw these salivary hormone testing kits they were doing in Germany at the time, brought the technology back. They literally set up a lab in Ilias' garage in Los Angeles, California, and started testing. It's kind of like when you hear about Apple Computer and Steve Jobs and Wozniak starting, you know, their first computer in a garage of Steve, Steve's, uh, you know, parents or whatever. I mean, these guys, like, just were making stuff up. They ran all these cortisol tests, and then they started to experiment with correcting the HPA axis. And their mission in their day, this is way before I came on the scene, I was, like, in high school, okay, their mission in their day was to figure out how can we fix this HPA axis without using drugs? Nothing prescription-based. How can we fix the HPA axis? And their sort of criteria for doing that was we want to test people. We want to give them a program. We want to pull them off of all the supplements. We want to retest them and show that there has been a serious, significant improvement in their production of these hormones, even though they're not doing any of the treatments at the time that they're retested, right? So you want a lab. You want an intervention period. You want to stop for a few days and see what the adrenal glands are doing so that you know that you're fixing the internal production. You're not just 
propping a person up while they're taking their product. So a lot of what they learned is highly counterintuitive. A lot of what they learned. Number one is they found in the, on the board here that high dosages were completely unnecessary and actually made people worse. What do I mean by that? If you give a large amount of DHEA, let's say 100 milligrams of DHEA all at one time, it will suppress, it will suppress, it will lower your internal production of DHEA. To make it even worse, if you're in a stage three, like Barbara is, right, you give high dosages of DHEA to a stage three, it lowers cortisol as well as lowering DHEA production. So you doubly make the person worse. Do they feel worse? Not necessarily. They could feel great if they're on a lot of DHEA. So again, their standard was not we're making people feel better. Their standard was we want to make sure that these hormones are actually getting corrected. The internal production, the internal production, the HPA axis is getting corrected, coming back online. So the dosages that we use are really, 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 really low. That was one of the biggest tricks they figured out. They also figured out that to reset the HPA axis, this is point number two here, and to restore normal internal production. Remember, we don't care how people feel. We want the internal production to come back. And when people have normal internal production, trust me, they feel great. To reset it, we had to use DHEA and pregnenolone in these very low dosages together at the same time. That was another big breakthrough. Large dosages didn't work. One product at a time didn't work. The combination of DHEA and pregnenolone worked the best. They also then experimented with pills and creams and sublinguals, and there's all kinds of different products on the market, and they determined that the sublinguals were the most effective, although you can use pills as well. Creams are the hardest to work with. You can do it, but it's a lot harder. So we, yeah. Low dosages, DHEA and pregnenolone together, based on the labs, and usually the sublinguals are going to work the best. Not always, but usually. So what I see a lot of times is the opposite of this. We see now patients having adrenal labs run and getting put on prescription hydrocortisone, right, or prescription cortisol. Um, what Ilias, Dr. Ilias and Dr. Timmons were trying to do in their research was to find a natural, non-prescription, non-harmful way of resetting all these systems. And, you know, drugs like hydrocortisone really are never necessary for adrenal fatigue. They may be necessary and you know, very necessary for people with endocrine disorders that are much more serious, but for adrenal exhaustion, we don't need to go to that extent. It's not effective. It doesn't work any better. So low dosages of DHEA and pregnenolone, and then, this is kind of obvious, but you, know, you also want to supply the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that the person needs for the adrenal glands to repair. Because we're resetting the HPA axis, providing these super low dosages that mimic normal production of DHEA and pregnenolone, and then the precursor nutrients that the adrenal glands need just to repair and function well. That could be anything from vitamin C to magnesium to B vitamins. Of course, you want to work with lifestyle changes. And uh, the, the lifestyle changes in this work are probably, as you guys know, 50 to 80% of why it works so well. So having a person eating healthier, that could be half of the success of the whole program. Getting their GI system fixed, that could be, you know, a third of the success of a whole program. You know, just dealing with the lifestyle variables from exercise to sleep, it's pretty much impossible to heal someone's adrenal glands if they're not sleeping well. So, you know, there, there's just sort of basic lifestyle stuff that we don't talk about or have tons of time to talk about today, but you just acknowledge or I'll just acknowledge, you know, that that's a huge part of the program of the lifestyle changes. Now, I want to talk a little bit about leaky gut because this is like, again, really popular and people get a little confused sometimes. Um, and the way that I was trained, very sp straightforward, was that leaky gut, or we could call it hidden inflammation, inflammatory stuff coming from the gut is one of the biggest stresses on the adrenal glands. Remember we said there's emotional, dietary, and inflammatory stresses? One of the major inflammatory stresses on the adrenal glands is coming from the gut. Remember, those three are in the order of importance. So emotional stress is the most uh, significant push on the adrenal glands. Um, bad relationships, emotional disconnection, lack of spiritual belief, confusion about what person is doing for their, with their life, all that kind of emotional stuff, angst and whatnot. Dietary stress, number two, and then inflammatory stresses are number three. So this is an important one to deal with. You've got to figure out what foods are pro-inflammatory, pull them out, diagnose and treat any parasites, bacteria, yeast, to make sure that any kind of inflammatory agent in the gut
hit push on the adrenal glands, sort of, um, bad relationships, emotional disconnection, lack of spiritual belief, confusion about what person is doing for their, with their life, all that kind of emotional stuff, angst and whatnot. Dietary stress, number two, and then inflammatory stresses are number three. So this is an important one to deal with. You've got to figure out what foods are pro-inflammatory, pull them out, diagnose and treat any parasites, bacteria, yeast, to make sure that any kind of inflammatory agent in the gut is removed so we know that things are going to work properly. If you don't adjust the gut, it's hard to fix the adrenals. You know? And the sort of a crossover mechanism here between the gut and adrenals is secretory IgA. So secretory immunoglobulin A, or SIG A, that's going to control the immune response in the gut. It's regulated itself by cortisol. So that means that if your cortisol is messed up, your SIG A is going to get messed up, and then your gut is a target. Right? Similarly, if your gut is inflamed for a long time because of foods or pathogens, that's going to mess up your SIG-A and mess up your cortisol because of the inflammatory component. So the gut health is dependent on the adrenals. The adrenals are dependent on the gut, right? This is a total chicken and egg kind of thing going back and forth. And what we want ideally, healthy sleep rhythm, healthy cortisol production we saw earlier, and we want a really healthy GI tract as well. So you can imagine, you know, these little villi, microvilli, gazillions of them sticking up in the gut. Right? And we want to make sure that there's, uh, you know, fully, they're fully intact, they're functioning well, they're absorbing well, and that there's no kind of damage to the intestinal tract. And this is what it should look like. Most of the people that we work with have some level of villus atrophy, meaning that rather than the normal projections sticking up like this, you know, they're blunted or damaged to a certain extent. Some people who are really highly damaged, it could be that they're flat and there's absolutely complete villus atrophy, meaning they're completely gone. But most of the people that we work with aren't that sick, and they still have some uh, villi. You know, we just need to get them to repair, get the leaky gut to work properly again to uh, complete this whole circuit, so to speak. So in terms of dietary stresses, remember, it's three major stresses, emotional, dietary, and inflammatory. So for dietary stresses, overconsumption of food is huge. Even if the person's eating really healthy food, if they're eating too much healthy food, that's a problem. We've got excess sugar, excess grains, you know, refined foods, just lack of vegetables, lack of fruit, lack of the healthy stuff. And then, of course, there's food allergies and food reactions that are extremely important, okay? And then stress, so emotional, dietary, and inflammatory stress. What are the different kinds of stress and how are we going to react to it and thinking about, I mean, this is my latest thing. You know, when we're talking about this in class, and, I, you know, I teach doctors every week, and we have a couple hundred doctors a year coming through my training program. So I talk to them all every week and um, in the different classes. And the interesting thing is how often, it's not just my practice, but how often we see in most of the practices that I work with that the emotional stressors are really the lead problem in that person's overall health picture. Now, you as an acupuncturist, me as a chiropractor, someone as a nutritionist, you know, that were me, it may not be something you're comfortable addressing. You may or may not want to do coaching or counseling work around emotional stuff. I personally don't, but I feel like it's our job to identify what the emotional, spiritual disconnection is and get the person directed in the right way. So if they're in a bad relationship, get them into couples counseling. If they're still grieving the loss of a parent, to get them to a grief counselor. If they're fighting addiction, I have a lot of patients working with addiction issues, they need to have an addiction counselor or a 12-step group or some kind of emotional support for their eating disorder or for their alcohol or drug addiction, whatever it may be. So just making sure that we're addressing the stress component, and even if you're not doing that work directly yourself, that you're sure that the person's getting the right kind of help that they need. And um, you don't have to be you know, doing all of this, but you want to make sure that you're able to cover all the different stresses that our, our folks are under. Now, we do a lot of coaching around food. This can get very complex into GAPS diets, uh, SCD diet, you know, food allergy elimination types of diets. But at the, at the most basic level, everyone at least needs to be eating you know, three meals a day, figuring out what the protein and veggie combination should be, having some carb, maybe some starchy carb, but being real careful because, of course, most of us overdo it with carbs, and realizing that for the adrenals, we're very, very carbohydrate sensitive. The adrenal glands are regulating blood sugar, so you have to be careful the excess carbs are really going to throw the adrenals off quickly. Some of the people that we work with have to avoid all grains and all inflammatory foods. Some people can get away with eating grains. Some people can even eat grains with gluten in them. So there's a spectrum, right? Some of my patients 
have to be 100% grain-free. Some just need to eliminate gluten-free grains. Some can even tolerate regular wheat bread. So trying to figure out where on the spectrum the person is, making sure they're getting good fats and they're, they're eating in a healthy way and they're relaxed, et cetera. And of course, the most common nutritional deficiency we all see is, you know, dehydration, so basic. So then this goes back to the old school guys again, Dr. Timmons and his gang. What they found was that a certain subset of adrenal fatigue patients only responded to their adrenal supplements when they went on a gluten, soy, and dairy-free diet. Does everybody have to do this? No. A lot of people, yeah. The more burned out the adrenals are, probably the more important this becomes. Line number two there, even more challenging, eliminating alcohol, caffeine, all the sodas. Obviously, alcohol is a sugar. It's going to affect the adrenal glands. It's going to affect your liver in a negative way. Caffeine, coffee is going to be a huge push on the adrenal glands. It's going to force you to make tons of cortisol. It's also hard on your liver. And the you know, sodas have their own set of evils to them. And then trying to get people directed into a healthy diet. We spend a lot of time on dietary counseling as part of this, so you know. Gluten and dairy-free, it can be a common, you know, trigger for the inflammatory response. And again, the more burned out the adrenals are, the more that we tend to want to lead towards uh, doing gluten and dairy-free diets. And then um, not everyone's reactive to milk. A lot of people drink milk and it can be quite healthy for them. But some people, you know, to make sure you identify those folks that can't tolerate milk. And then... Um, making sure that you're, uh, you know, dealing with the cravings. We work with a lot of eating disorders, and that's a whole other subspecialty. I have a whole talk on eating disorders, too, we do someday. It's pretty important stuff, okay? And then this is my favorite subject. We talk about this for months in the training program, like literally a couple months, which is finding the pathogens. Are there bacteria like C. diff and H. pylori causing chronic inflammation and gut problems and adrenal exhaustion? Are there parasites like Giardia or Ehisto or Blasto or Crypto? or Ascaris. I had two patients last week that had, um, you know, parasitic worms in their guts. Just disgusting and important to knock out. I mean, how are you going to be healthy if you have like a nest full of worms living in your intestinal tract that are eating all your food for you? And then, of course, the ever-present candida issue. We do a lot of lab work for candida, try to figure that one out. It's a hard one to figure out with the testing. And then we've got, a member emotional, dietary, and inflammatory stresses. So diet, you can control with things like gluten-free, grain-free, sugar-free, trying to get the inflammatory foods out, making sure the blood sugar is controlled because adrenals play a big role in blood sugar. Inflammation, we start with the gut. We also work with the liver. You want to make sure there's no gut infections. You get the diet under control. You get the inflammation in the gut down. Now you're setting the stage for the adrenal hormones to be able to repair. And then their biggest one, and this is the number one stress on the adrenal glands in terms of importance, and probably the hardest one for us to work with as practitioners is how we all react to emotional and spiritual stress. Um, oh my gosh, we talked about this for years, right? So I don't even know what to say. I mean, I've studied this for so long. I've worked with this for so long on so many people. It, it's, it's really, what, let me put it this way. We, were, we had a, I was in LA last month, about two months ago, and I, I went out to dinner it was at a you know a conference, a health conference. I went out to dinner just by happenstance with this one, two doctor friends, and we met these other doctors at the restaurant. We ended up sitting down, eight of us at this table, uh, to have dinner at a really great like farm to table organic food restaurant in LA. Go figure, okay? And so it's eight doctors sitting around a table. I was the youngest. I'm a, I'm 50 years old in a couple of weeks. I was the youngest doctor there. And I added it up. Everyone at the table had been in practice. I have been in practice 22, 23 years. Everybody else at the table had been in practice for at least 30 years, some 40, 45 years of practice. So pretty, there's a couple hundred years of clinical experience at this table. And each one of these doctors, in different ways, said the same thing, which is that, and this is at the end of 30 or 40 years, right? Well, you know, it really all boils down to our spiritual connection, doesn't it? People get unhealthy when they're not spiritually connected. I see all my patients are spiritually disconnected. I find that, you know, different ways, they, all through the evening, and we were, we were stuck waiting for the meal for like a couple hours. There's some delay in the kitchen. So we had a long time to talk. And everybody in a different way said the same thing, which was that after all these decades of experience, they realized that, yeah, of course they're doing chiropractic or acupuncture. Or they're practicing medicine still. They're not not doing their you know, how they were trained as a medical doctor, acupuncturist, or chiropractor, but that they realize, you know, 
not at the end of their careers, but sort of at the peak of their careers after 30 or 40 years of practice, that that emotional and spiritual connection is really at the heart of all disease. And so when you get that kind of brain power and that kind of experience all saying the same thing, you've got to realize there's a truth to this, which is that the heart of all the issues that we deal with is emotional and spiritual disconnection. Now, whether you talk to your patients about that or not, it's totally a different decision. But if you know that inside, that's maybe something that you communicate without talking about it. For example, my teacher, Dr. Timmons, never said a word about spiritual practice, God, religion, or anything, and yet his primary understanding was that patients were in a spiritual crisis. He never mentioned it. He was old school, right? Not a word. All those years I studied with him, did he ever bring it up? I listened to him work with hundreds of patients. I was always there by his side watching him work with patients. He never talked about spiritual stuff ever. But he expressed it through his being, right? So that's what we're talking about. Either you deal with this verbally and you talk to people about it, or you just deal with this privately on your own so that you can communicate to people the, the value of this. And this is really what I feel is the key. So individual perception, internalization of life events. What that means is that you know, you have something bad that happens. Someone dies. Okay. What's your emotional response going to be to that? Right? It's going to change your electricity, your system. Right? What we're looking at, the cortisol levels are going to change. Thyroid hormones are going to change. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, they're all going to change. So you're going to be changes throughout the body, the brain, the hormones, the central nervous system, etc. And you're going to respond to that with a physiological effect. And a lot of how you actually respond is under your control based on your emotional and spiritual health. And the less emotionally connected and spiritually connected you are, the more devastating stress becomes. So I don't talk about that very often with patients, but it's something I just kind of keep in the background. And I talk about it a little bit more now than I used to. seems like by the time doctors hit the 30, 40 year mark, that's, they're, they're kind of coming out and talking about it all the time. I work a lot with athletes, okay? And um, we see this, and it could be like an everyday athlete, it could be a professional athlete, right? So we see the overactivity, pushing, 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 that you see with athletes, and you see the same thing with a corporate executive who's maybe doing this with work rather than with athletics, is that you know, you're going to just get burned out. And the healthier the adrenal glands are, the more stress we can handle. So a lot of times in the beginning, we have to have people back off and exercise and do more restorative stuff to start to repair, right? And then there's basic lifestyle guidelines. We, um, uh, proper exercise, the stress relief, talk a little bit about, you know, sleep is super important, making sure relationships are healthy and good and all working well for you. And then here's the, um, the basic process that we go through, just so you can see how this would roll out if you want to start doing this in your clinic. You do an initial consult, you get the person to buy the test kits, um, they collect samples, they go home, they do the samples, the analysis comes in, you get a lab report back, you sit down with them, this is the hardest part probably, you go through the lab, you interpret it, you explain what it means, what they should do, you start to design protocols, get them set up for follow-up and then for maintenance. So, you know, I've done this with so many hundreds of doctors now, it's more complicated than it seems on the surface. There's a lot of moving parts, and you're really setting up a whole new part of your practice. So, uh, part of the, just getting the flow right with this takes people a year or two to get it all down, okay? Now, in terms of actually what we do in terms of lab work, if you want to start doing some of the testing, we test hormones. I do the adrenal testing on everyone. If they have a thyroid problem, I actually refer thyroid hormones out. I don't do them personally in my practice, but I do all adrenal and female hormone testing myself. Some of you may want to do thyroid, some maybe not. We test everyone for the GI problems, parasites, H. pylori, yeast, food allergies, etc. And then we test everyone for liver detox pathways that could be resulting from heavy metals, chemicals in the system, et cetera. Right? So remember three different body systems, we test hormones, gut, detox. Again, in my practice as a chiropractor, I don't do any blood testing. We only just do salivary stool and urine. I refer out to the MDs that I work with to do the blood work. Some of you may want to do the blood testing, some may not. Okay? And then this is you know, the, 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 really, the big picture message, right? which is that physical health is this platform for emotional and spiritual growth. And that if we can get people dialed in and get their adrenal rhythms and female hormones just right, and we can get them um, you know, working, the gut working and then detox, then they can take these other steps and go out into the world and, and start to do these other things, okay? So I'm sure you guys might have some questions. I'm happy to stay on the line here, talk about that, anything that's come up.
and clarify any of the things that have come up on, on uh, the presentation. That was great. So thank you, Dr. Dan Kalish, and we do have lots of questions. Um, before we just get into the questions, I just want to remind people, after we're done here, the recording's over. When I stop recording, stick around if you're looking uh, for a way to get a discount to um, Dan's ProD seminar course he has um, online for 12 CEUs. I have a, a nice generous discount for you. So stick around at the end of the recording and I can give that to you today. Um, so now let's get into uh, some of the, uh, the questions here. Um, oh, please note that Dan also has a talk on diagnosing and resolving heartburn, reflux, stomach pain, and nausea, and also a, a webinar on Medagogy also for free on how to solve allergies and functional medicine. So just check out Medagogy.com how to access both the handouts and uh, those, uh, those webinars. And um, just a correction here, that's um, 12 CEUs um, for this course that's coming up on Pro-D. Um, again, you can check out our Pro-D seminars. Um, and in this class is nice because it's functional medicine that is made just for um, acupuncturists. So it's for acupuncturists that want to um, introduce um, some of this into their practice. Here in Vancouver, um, Acubalance Wellness Center, we're a Chinese medicine integrative clinic, and we've brought on a naturopath that does all the testing that Dr. Dan is talking about with the stool, the urine, saliva, and even the dark field microscope in our practice. And it's been really wonderful for our patients because they love to see the test and understand where these imbalances are. And so we're using the orthomolecular, the IVs, and the testing like Dr. Dan does as well as we're adding our acupuncture and Chinese herbs. So it's, it's been really brilliant for us. We're very excited, which is why I wanted to bring this to my colleagues because it's working well for us. So uh, we have Dan teaching this. And um, if you want to know more about his, his comprehensive program, because we just have a 12-hour program on Pro-D, go to the kalishwellness.com website, um, and you can link around there. You can see a, a lot of stuff that Dr. Dan Kalish is offering. So I just wanted to let you know. Oh, sorry, Lauren, it's the Kalish Institute. Kalish Institute, sorry. So kalishinstitute.com? Yeah. yeah, Kalish Wellness is for patients, and the Kalish Institute is for practitioners. Perfect. All right, so let's let's take what has been a complex uh, uh, material and concept and thank Dan, first of all, for distilling this down and, and simplifying it. And I'm going to put up some of these questions here. So I'm just going to throw these here up on the page so you can kind of read them as well as listen and see if we can get through some of these. And I will take your uh, phone number off of here. Okay, so at the beginning you talked about about the sequence of how you treat, um, and they just want to know what is the sequence again, and why was it so important to treat that? I think you just wanted to clarify how you went on the sequence of treating. Yeah, because the a very common sequence is to do GI first, and then to deal with hormones later, and so all of this work that I was trained in was predicated on the original docs doing these labs and then making mistakes and making people worse. And what they found with coming out of the blocks and just going right to GI treatments without setting the person up with the adrenal program led to much higher treatment failures. And the reason is because of secretory IgA. It took them a while to figure this out. But if you test and correct the adrenal glands first in the first few months of the treatment before you go over and start to kill GI bugs, right? You're going to have an increase in secretory IgA, a strengthening of the host's immunity, which is the main determinant in flushing out the bug. So the longer that you wait and the longer that you hold in there and do an adrenal protocol, the easier it is to kill any kind of an infection and the less you'll have food reactions as well. Um, but we usually, we, so we usually lead off with the adrenal program and the diet first, wait for a few months and then start killing bugs. That's sort of the typical protocol. Okay. And I'm going to jump around with some of these questions here. Um, just, you talked about the uh, adrenal issue and being overweight, the visceral fat. What about mm -hmm. somebody who has adrenal fatigue who is naturally quite slim? Does that change your approach? Uh, no. So, I mean, just based on the labs, you would do the same protocol. So for someone who's quite slim, they would probably have some other ramification of the abnormal cortisol, like they may be wired, for example. Like It's kind of strange. You know, some people who are in a stage 3 adrenal burnout get really depressed and lethargic and tired. Other people ramp it up and they get wired. They go to, you know, this tired and wired, this sort of spectrum. They get anxious and wired the more exhausted they get. Interesting. Okay. Um, just jumping around here, you talked about um, some of the supplements you like besides the DHEA and the uh, pregnolone. Um, mm -hmm. 
with the magnesium, what what form do you like? Because some magnesium can be hard on the on the on the gut and cause diarrhea. Do you have a preference for magnesium? Yeah, usually they you know it's like multi chelated to so it's bound to a whole bunch of different carrier molecules. Um, a lot of the companies, not all of them, use I think uh, you know, their manufacturer that supplies them is Albion Labs. So if they're using Albion Labs minerals, that's a, a good sign. That's not a supplement company, but they're a manufacturer that sells to a lot of different companies. Or as long as it's chelated to several different carriers, it works pretty well. Okay. Um, back to the DHEA um, and the uh, pregnenolone. Uh, you talked about you don't like to use the high doses. As there was an issue with that, and you use a low dose. Um, and the question is, wondering what kind of doses equals low dose when you talk about DHEA and uh, pregnenolone. Okay, so we use the DHEA in a liquid, and low dosages is like two milligrams. Two milligrams. <laughs> That's pretty low. Um, low dose pregnenolone is like six milligrams. Like they're, they're, usually the dosages are so low you couldn't even buy a pill that's made that low. Um, and there's certain conversions that we do with the liquids to the pills and whatnot, but usually um, somewhere in that two milligram, six milligram range uh, spread throughout the day. Okay. Um, and if the tests were normal uh, for DHEA but low for pregnenolone, um, would you still supplement with the DHEA or just go with the uh, test that shows that was low? Yeah, so there's a lot of different patterns. This is why it takes a few months to teach people this. But there is one pattern where it's not very common, but once in a while you see where you do not need to use a DHEA because their internal production of DHEA is already okay. It's probably the least common of all the patterns, but sometimes we see that. Thank you. Um, just on a side to that, you know, in the fertility clinics until still, but recently um, they were using high dose of DHEA, 75 uh, milligrams a day, 25 milligrams three times a day. Um, you don't really have to answer this, but I, it's, it's just interesting based on a lot of these women are advanced maternal age, uh, experiencing adrenal fatigue and gut issues. So um, I'm, I'm, it's interesting that that approach they're using. And I would share that the most recent studies as of mid-2014 are showing that the DHEA um, in big studies are not improving their fertility as they, they thought once was. Yeah, now the thing is, it all depends on what stage they're in, because if their cortisol levels are extremely high, larger amounts of DHEA lower cortisol, right? So you can actually use DHEA in larger amounts to your advantage, but if you don't know where the cortisol sit, then it's easy to, to get that one wrong. We have a coffee question. So it says here, a two-part question. What is Dr. Kalish's view on coffee? I'm assuming it's not a good one, so what would be the best advice for patients who choose to indulge? To indulge? Would it have less impact if um, ingested during the natural cortisol peak? Yeah, so I think there's two or three answers to that question. One answer is just pull everybody off of all caffeine right away and just make it a requirement during the program. That leads to a lot of grumpy patients. You may or may not want to do that. But most everybody that gets off caffeine, once they get through the withdrawals, feels a lot better. Um, the other attitude, and I do this one more often now, is to just have them reduce their caffeine intake by half every two weeks until they eventually taper off of it. So if they have three cups a day, cut it back to two cups for two weeks, then cut it to a cup for two weeks, and then go to decaf for two weeks, and then stop. You know, some kind of a reduction like that. It doesn't make a lot of sense to consume caffeine while you're trying to rebuild your adrenal glands. It's just going to interfere with the program. And then once their adrenals are normal, they can drink caffeine whenever they feel like. Um, and a lot of people are dependent on caffeine. They can't get to work and function well unless they have it. So until their adrenals start to pick up, they may need to do that you know, gradual reduction. Thank you. Um, can you recommend the labs that you're using for these adrenals? You, you're sending those out or are you doing that in-house, the adrenals? Oh, yeah. So we send them out. There's a lab company called BioHealth Diagnostics. Um, they do all my adrenal testing and all the GI testing. Good. Another question. Um, you talked about milk and gluten allergies. What about other common food allergies like seafood, peanuts, etc.? Thanks. And um, I'm not sure what in context that was anymore, so I don't know. If you have something to say about that, we can answer that. Otherwise, we're going to go on. You're talking about milk and gluten, and they want to know about other allergies. I'm assuming that impacts the adrenal and health as well. Yeah, any allergy would, but you know, if if you if you're like a you know eat a strawberry, your face turns red, or you eat shrimp and you get nauseous. I mean, the the immediate reactions are pretty obvious for people. What we're more concerned about with food allergies are ones that are subtle and hard for people to identify. Um, most people that have a gluten problem don't really know they have a gluten problem until they stop eating it. So those that's a little bit more of the focus. 
um, if they're testing for those kinds of allergies. Okay. Do you have a model diet that you tend to recommend? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, it has these components, right? Gluten, dairy, soy free, blood sugar control. Once you get healthy enough, you can do fasting and intermittent fasting if you want. But in the beginning, you know, you need to keep your blood sugar pretty controlled. And then the question just becomes, you know, what's your protein, fat, carb ratio going to look like? Which varies depending on person's activity level, how old they are, you know. So you might have to, you know, that has, you, know, you can't give like a one size fits all answer towards. But um, we try to teach people sort of parameters so they can dial in each individual right with the macronutrient ratios. Um, then we were talking about the gut health, and the, the question was, um, I think it was a two-part question, but one of them was, what about your um, ulcerative colitis patients or patients uh, with inflammatory bowel disease that no longer have a large intestine? What kind of prognosis do you give them, um, um, considering how important the gut is for their overall health? Oh, yeah. I mean, regardless of how damaged the intestinal tract is, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, some inflammatory bowel disorder, you can still test and correct the adrenal glands and fix all the other gut-related issues. And, you know, you could not expect someone to be able to cure themselves of Crohn's disease necessarily, but certainly you can improve overall health and even improve digestive health in people that have these inflammatory bowel problems. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a few more here, but I want to be respectful of Dr. Chaos's time. And so we're going to wrap this up. And again, if you want to... Um, you know, this is why we're going to have Dr. Kalish on several occasions. He's, he's coming back. we got some other uh, webinars on Medagogy with Dr. Kalish. And again, we have the one on Pro-D. So um, in an hour, um, you're not going to become an expert in an hour. Ho hopefully that expectation was set right up at the beginning that um, it would be, wouldn't it be great, though, if we could just take one hour and then we're set for life, right? But life, <laughs> you're going to learn. You have to learn like you're going to live forever, right? So um, I just wanted to thank everybody and stick around because I'm going to stop the recording and let those who are interested in getting uh, $100 off on Dr. Uh, Kalish's Pro-D course um, for 12 CEUs. And then, again, that course was made specifically for acupuncturists who want to incorporate functional medicine. Um, stick around. And again, Dr. Kalish, I want, to, I want to thank you very much. And I look forward to moderating more of your classes. And, uh, and your book is excellent and you're even better in person. So. Um, I want to remind everybody also about the Kalish Institute website. Um, and again, if you're really looking to incorporate functional medicine into your practice, um, then here's a great uh, doctor to, to train with because he's created a program to really help you um, incorporate this into your practice. So thank you very much. Hey, pleasure working with you, Lauren. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed um, that enlightening and informative presentation by Dr. Dan Kalish. Do check out his books. Um, they're, again, very interesting, his website. We have a couple other talks on our Medagogy.com website by Dr. Dan Kalish, and uh, we'll be offering more of these also on the AccuBalance website. And again, if you're interested in being treated in this style here at AccuBalance, we use an integrative approach using Chinese medicine, naturopathy, and functional medicine, and we are using the Kalish method. Um, so we can offer the testing that he talks about for the adrenals, and your gut health, liver pathways, and also a treat um, using his approach as well. So at AccuBalance, we're um, a group of passionate, dedicated doctors of Chinese medicine, naturopaths, and we're now working with medical doctors as well to implement the Kalish method. So I hope this um, gives you some ideas of where some of your symptoms may be coming from and a lot of things that you can do. And obviously, we always talk so much at our clinic about how diet impacts your health, a lifestyle like exercise, rest, sleep, and as we hear, see here, how important your emotional health is. So we're always happy to coach around stress reduction and improving your, your mood and your emotional um, resilience. Again, thanks for tuning in. My name is Dr. Lauren Brown, I'm clinical director and founder of AccuBalance Wellness Center here in British Columbia, Canada, and I hope uh, you got something out of today's lecture.